Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Patricia Carvelis, and it is my great pleasure to host the 2020 Stella Prize. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we meet on wherever we may be and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as First Australians watching this broadcast around the country and internationally. The Stella Prize is Australia's most prestigious award celebrating the writing of women and non-binary writers. Tonight is the eighth year of the Stella Prize, and it's being awarded, it's fair to say, in pretty unusual circumstances. We're finding ourselves in genuinely unprecedented times. It's difficult, it's smashing the arts community, and it's making our lives more difficult than it ever has been. So while we don't have the chance to gather in person, and of course that's disappointing for many of us, we can still gather socially. We can be physically distant, but socially very present in each other's lives, talking about women and women's literature by using the hashtag 2020 Stella Prize. Thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate the vibrancy and the complexity of Australian women's writing. And thank you to the Wheeler Centre for books, writing and ideas for having, well, mainly just me. Usually I'd like to say us, but of course, in this new era of social distancing, or what I like to say, social, not social, but physical distancing, it's pretty much just me hanging out here talking to you at home. The winner of the 2020 Stella Prize joins past winners. Carrie Tiffany, Claire Wright, Emily Beto, Charlotte Wood, Heather Rose, Alexis Wright, and Vicky Laveau Harvey. It's a deeply impressive lineup to be part of. I think it's impossible to continue without acknowledging what a deeply worrying and disruptive time that we're all living in, particularly people who are in the arts community, the literary community. It's a health emergency, of course, but we all know it's very much become an economic emergency. It's filled with uncertainty about the future, and I know that people watching this will be struggling very much on a personal level as well. The book selling industry, this industry is struggling immensely in the wake of this crisis. For the arts community, this has been crushing. What we must not allow to continue, however, is for the further marginalisation of women's voices through this time. The integral work of the Stella Prize and its supporters in championing women's voices must continue. It is more important than ever. Women must emerge from this crisis with their stories told and they must emerge strong. Over the course of this evening, we'll hear from our friends from across the country, as well as a really special guest, former Prime Minister Julia Gillard, and the winner of the 2020 Stella Prize. And we're really looking forward to that. I mean, that's what you're all waiting for. But be patient. Hang around with me too. The 2020 Stella Prize shortlist is See What You Made Me Do by Jess Hill, published by Black Ink. Diving Into Glass by Caro Llewellyn, published by Penguin Random House. There Was Still Love by Favel Parrot by Hachette Australia. Here Until August by Josephine Rowe, published by Black Ink. The Yield by Tara June Winch, published by Penguin Random House. The Weekend by Charlotte Wood, published by Alan and Unwin. To commence the official proceedings, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Bouchon, the Executive Director of Stella. At Stella, we believe that the stories and perspectives of Australian women and non-binary writers matter. And the Stella Prize exists to recognise and to celebrate the contribution that these writers make to our national culture. Stella is an advocate for the power of writers and writing to change our minds, to introduce us to new ways of living, uh, to help us imagine a different world, and crucially, to create the systemic changes needed to combat gender inequality in Australia. Each year, the Stella Prize is awarded from a long list of 12 and a short list of six. Uh, my congratulations to all of the 2020 Stella authors. Your books represent the best writing by Australian women in the past 12 months. And we thank you for your talent and your craft and your dedication and your creativity. There's deep uncertainty in the literary sector at the moment and authors' livelihoods are being affected. 
Stella is pleased to be able to support all of our 2020 authors with prize money at both the long and short list stage. This is thanks entirely to the support we receive from the Copyright Agency's Cultural Fund, as well as our strong community of regular donors. On top of that, tonight's winner will receive $50,000 in prize money. This is money that buys an author time to think, time to write, perhaps time to start their next book. It's entirely possible thanks to the support we receive from the Wilson Foundation. And Stella is proud to be working with the Wilson Foundation as our award partner. Our sincere thanks to Karen Wilson, to Kirsten Ross, and to everyone at the Wilson Foundation. You are an integral, if off-screen, participant in this celebration. Everything that we do at Stella, the prize, the annual Stella count, and our Stella Schools program is made possible thanks to the support of a wide range of dedicated individuals and organisations. Firstly, to Catherine Andrews, our tireless ambassador for Stella and a true champion of Australian women writers, as well as readers, thank you for everything that you do. To our patrons, Ellen Koshland, our founding donor, Joanna Bavesky, Paula McLean and the McLean Foundation, the Beverly Shelton Estate, and Carol Schwartz and the Trawala Foundation. Each of you have made an indelible contribution to Stella over the last eight years. Thank you so much for matching our ambition and our enthusiasm with your own vision and determination. To the 2020 Stella judges, led by our extraordinary chair, Lou Swin, thank you so much for the rigour and the clarity that you brought to this year's judging process. Uh, the Stella judges are asked each year to identify works that are excellent, original and engaging. And as a group this year, you not only dedicated yourself to that task, uh, you went well above and beyond in terms of delivering, and you have gifted to the Australian reading public and our Stella book clubs around the country an extraordinarily impressive um, reading list to sink their teeth into. So thank you not only for the work that you've done for Stella, but your advocacy and support to readers all around the country. I also really want to thank Patricia Carvalis and Julia Gillard for their support for Stella and for being endlessly adaptable as we reimagined the format for this announcement. Uh, the Stella Prize announcement is the biggest night in our calendar and we are thrilled to have you involved. Thanks so much. I also want to thank the Stella Board. That's Lisa Cotton, Di Cooker, Eleanor Jackson, Paula McLean, Karen Murray, Claire Wyville Plater, Beth Shaw, and our inexhaustible chair, Sari Rankin. Your insights, your enthusiasm, and your advocacy for Stella always go above and beyond, and I'm thrilled to work with all of you. Finally, Stella is a tiny but mighty team, and I want to thank our program manager, Anna Boato, our schools manager, Lenny Robinson, and Connor O'Brien from Studio Sometimes. These three individuals are a force of positivity and creativity and energy, and they are without doubt the best colleagues I could have asked for. Uh, now to all of our wide community of readers and writers and publishers and booksellers, educators, partners, donors, everyone who has tuned in for this announcement, we're thrilled to have you participate. We're excited to be announcing the 2020 Stella Prize for you shortly. Thanks so much for being a part of it and happy reading. There is a great skill and complexity in this year's shortlisted books. Instead of having us tell you about these extraordinary books, I shouldn't be doing that. Let's hear from the shortlisted authors themselves. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Jess Hill, the author of See What You Made Me Do, published by Black Ink. You can probably hear the lilt of commercial radio from next door as the construction continues apace. No house will not be renovated under COVID-19. Um, but hopefully we can speak over that. So, so what do I hope for for the future of literature in the next 12 months? You know, I think we're through the looking glass now. We've had the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. We've had the overdue platforming of incredible Indigenous creativity. 
and we're past the world where we can believe that only white men write the great books. If you don't write your story with a consciousness of diversity and with a consciousness of the dark past of this country and of the forces that have been bubbling up for a long time, any writing that doesn't tell stories with an awareness of that is going to be seen as throwback. I think in this country, we're at a critical point in the dialogue between our willingness to confront the truth, the hard truths, like you know the Royal Commissions into Institutional Child Sex Abuse, into Family Violence, even the brilliance of Indigenous culture, um, such as you know through the popularity of Dark Emu, and the regressive desire to retreat into a "How good is Australia?" "Hands off Australia Day," Aussie, Aussie, Aussie uh, type of thing. So I'd like to see more stories that are set in the tension between these two forces, the desire to bring out the truth and move forward and the regressive and quite magnetic forces that would drag us back to a mythical past. I'm now excited to introduce Caro Llewellyn, the author of Diving Into Glass, published by Penguin Random House. I think it's been a very hard time for publishers over the last little while and um, and I hope that if there can be a silver lining about what's going on at the moment and while we're all here on video and not in person um, is that people are realising the importance of books and the, and the great joy of reading and um, for writers I think the opportunity to dig deep and to really explore what's happened, why we're here in this terrible situation. Um, I think writers are more important than ever to help us understand where we are as a society and where the hope lies. And I think that's the wonderful thing about books and reading and writers is that they show us the joy in the world, even through the dark and dark times that we're in. I am now delighted to introduce Favelle Parrish, the author of There Was Still Love, published by Hachette. I'd like to thank everyone involved with the Stella Prize. It's been such an amazing journey being long-listed and then short-listed, and it's such an important prize. I'm just so grateful. It means the world to me. It's probably the biggest highlight of my career. So thank you. This is my studio where I created the novel, There Was Still Love. Here is my wall of sort of Prague in the 80s. Um, so, and they then not only stuck all these on the wall, but then coloured bits in with fluorescent pencils. It was a very important process it helped me see the novel, which is, to me, in black and white with these highlights of fluorescent, these scenes, these memories um, that jump out. It is my pleasure to now introduce Josephine Rowe, the author of Here Until August, published by Black Ink. Hello, Stella. I don't know about you, but I needed to get some sunshine while there was still some sunshine going. So I brought us down to the Elwood Canal, where at this hour there are usually a lot of rowdy birds, as you can hear, and some rowdy children as well. Um, thank you so much for including Here Until August on the 2020 shortlist, alongside such a wonderful lineup of novelists and journalists and memoirists and so thrilled and so honoured to be in that company and I just want to say a very quick thank you to Catapult, my publishers in the US and to Black Ink in Australia for all of the time and the care and the patience they gave to these stories over the past few years. I hope everybody tonight is having a wonderful night in your lounge rooms and whatever time zone you're in. And thank you again. Bye. And now we'll cross oceans to introduce you to Tara June Winch, the author of The Yield, published by Penguin Random House. I hope you guys will pick up The Yield um, and not be afraid to do so, not be, um, not feel ashamed to look at our collective past. Um, it's, it's, it's a book of hope, 
ultimately, I hope it's a book of hope. And I hope that you can find your connection and sense of belonging as an Australian um, through this book. Um, I think in the horror that I wrote, there's always ultimately um, truth and truth is a beautiful thing. I'm really looking forward to reading more women's voices in general this year and in the in the coming couple of years, I guess. Um, especially minority voices because we really have something to say. Um, they're voices that have been suppressed for, for, for decades and um, they have these essential deep stories um, that I think are a balm and a salve at this uncertain time. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to and seeing who's on the long list next year. I am delighted to introduce you to Charlotte Wood, the author of The Weekend, published by Alan and Unwin, and the winner of the 2016 Stella Prize for The Natural Way of Things. I'm incredibly lucky to have had some amazing people on my side for a long time with my books. My agent, Jenny Darling, my publisher, Jane Palfreyman, and the amazing Alan and Unwin team that Jane pulled together for this book to get out into the world. Uh, especially Ali Laveau, um, Krista Munns, Sandy Cole, Jane Finnamore, Christine Farmer, and all their sales and marketing team. I thank independent booksellers because none of us would be here without you. And of course, I thank my dear writing friends and most of all, my partner, Sean McElvoke. When Matisse was a bedridden invalid living in the middle of a war zone, still making art, his amazing, beautiful paper cutouts. He said, space has the boundaries of my imagination. So what I would love for Australian literature in the next 12 months is for us to remember that, um, for us writers to keep working, keep imagining and producing maybe the greatest literature that our country has seen yet. I'd also love our leaders to understand <clears throat> what's already been made very, very plain. And that's that in a crisis, we turn first to music, to art, to books. We turn to creators to help us stay loving and sane and thoughtful and calm in terrible times. So I'd love to see Australian literature take its rightful place, not to one side as a sort of pretty luxury, but right in the centre of our culture as essential to the heart and soul of our country and crucial to the reimagination and the reinvention of our culture that has to take place now. Stella's Impact to Date is a community and collective success. We are an ambitious organisation and our goals are achievable thanks to the support of a range of donors and partners. So to everyone who already supports Stella, our deepest thanks. And to those of you who might be hearing about Stella for the first time tonight, if you have the capacity, I invite you to contribute to our future. There are two easy ways you could do this. One is a donation to our annual operations and programs, and the other is helping us safeguard the future. The Stella Forever Fund has been established to ensure that we are able to award the Stella Prize into perpetuity. Both donations are a lasting legacy to Stella, and we're eternally grateful for those who are on the journey with us. Full details are on our website. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Julia Gillard, former Prime Minister of Australia, and of course, the only female Prime Minister our country has ever seen. She was Australia's 27th Prime Minister and has now become a champion for women and for women's literature as well. She's also become an ambassador for mental health and so many causes around the world for women and for women's education. Julia Gillard has also, in recent times, well, she's become very helpful to a lot of women as we become increasingly obsessed with hand washing as we're dealing with this unprecedented event and pandemic. Now, we all know that hand washing has become the new normal. It has to be 30 seconds. Don't believe 20 seconds. 30 seconds is what you should aim for. And there is no better way to do that than by reciting Julia Gillard's now infamous misogyny speech. 
If you spend a lot of time online, as I do, and I know you all do too, that misogyny speech is the perfect script for your hand washing. She's, of course, done a lot more than just helped us with hand washing. She has been a champion for so many issues. Here she is. This is Julia Gillard. Thank you, Patricia. No matter where you are in Australia, I'm sure you join me in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and in a spirit of reconciliation, paying our respects to elders past and present. I'm literally all dressed up with nowhere to go, but I'm so grateful that we are still able to gather in this way. My hearty congratulations to the organisers for creating this new format for the Stella Prize in this difficult time. Tonight, I'm not going to go into detail about the impacts of the coronavirus, you know all of that already, but in all the negativity, I think there are a few heartening things to remember. First, this will come to an end. Second, by staying home, we are saving lives. Third, as human beings, we are all in the fight against the virus together. Fourth, while this pandemic means we have not been able to gather in person, it has bolstered the power of literature. All over the world, people are drawing intellectual, emotional and spiritual nourishment from books. As our individual spaces become smaller, we are remembering how to exercise the imagination muscle of our childhoods and using books and stories as an escape and as a comfort. We are also relying on the written word to speak the truth to us when we are bombarded with information and messaging and noise from across the globe. And when we come out of the other side of this together, we will rely on our writers and artists to retell the many millions of individual stories of the crisis and to distill its deeper truths. So I'm delighted to be celebrating the Stellar Award here with you tonight a prize that recognises and rewards women who write their truth. This recognition is important because historically women have been excluded from Western literature and the barriers start early. Today, nearly two thirds of the world's illiterate adults are women. One of my great passions post politics is working to ensure that every child, including the poorest and most marginalised girls, gets a good quality education. I want the next generation and the generations that follow to be able to have a love of learning and of books. The education gap is just one dimension of the overall global gender gap across politics, economics, education and health. Unfortunately, we know that this gap at current rates of progress won't close for another 100 years. That means that no one watching this video address will live long enough to see equality realised. Indeed, my great niece Isla, who is currently tormenting her parents as they attempt to work from home, probably won't live to see it. She's turning five this year. We can and must do better we must accelerate the rate of change. There is no one silver bullet that will get us there. Gender discrimination is complex, layered, multifaceted. It incorporates everything from our youngest girls being swathed in pink and given dolls to play with, to older women retiring with less superannuation. It includes the many barriers that prevent women from maximising their career potential and the uneven division of domestic labour, even in households where both partners work full time. It includes sexual and other violence against women around the globe. It extends to the unconscious bias that whispers in our heads and tells us that women leaders aren't likeable, are cold, are ruthless. Changing all of this requires evidence-based tools and policies, practical things that business, governments, trade unions and civil society can and should do. In my role as chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, I spend much of my time now working with a world-class team of researchers who are focused on discovering the most effective ways forward. But while I'm a big advocate for that kind of hard-headed attack on gender inequality, I know that by itself, 
it will not be enough. Our cultural predispositions in all their richness and with all their historical biases are woven into how we think, how we relate to each other, how we design our societies and whether we have the imagination and willingness to collectively dream and then embrace a different, fairer, more decent and caring future. That's why it's vital to address gender bias in the literary world. If women's voices are disproportionately excluded from our storytelling, then we cannot weave a more inclusive and richer shared culture. In my own life, I have felt and continue to feel the immense power of women's words. When I was a much younger woman, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale and Anne Summers' Damned Whores and God's Police helped me understand sexism and misogyny and where it might lead. It's not too much of a stretch to say that I have lived a different life than I otherwise would have because of the power of those books and so many others that have informed me, challenged me, shaped me. I want women and girls, every one of them, to also feel that power, not by having to search out the occasional publication by a woman, but through being surrounded by great books by women. And on achieving that, I'm pleased to say that while there is still work to be done, there are signs of improvement. Conducted with academics from the Australian National University and Monash University, the stellar count evaluates the extent of gender bias within book reviewing in Australia. In 2012, an analysis of publications found that 40% of all reviews were of books written by women. In 2018, that figure was closer to 49%. Nine out of the 12 publications surveyed have now reached or exceeded parity in terms of their representation of women authors. Now that's fantastic news. This shows that accountability is important to getting results. Targets work. What we choose to count matters. The statistics gathered by the Stella Count suggests that the act of counting influences the gender balance of literary journalism in Australia. And in turn, that goes on to influence which books become known, bought and read. Public recognition of books also makes a difference to what becomes known, bought and read. That brings us to the work of the Stella Prize and this gathering. My congratulations to all of these shortlisted authors. I have some insight into what you go through. In fact, I spent the first part of this year in self-imposed exile, completing a manuscript for my forthcoming book, which I am co-authoring with my friend Ngozi Okonjo-E Wheeler. We have written what we hope is an inspirational and practical book, sharing the stories, advice and words of some of our most extraordinary women leaders from around the world. However, I'd have to say, if I knew then what I know now about how much self-isolation there would be this year, I might have given myself some more time out. As authors, you know writing is hard work, but reading is a pleasure. Let's celebrate both tonight through recognising extraordinarily talented Australian authors. I thank you. The 2020 Stella Prize is awarded to the best book by an Australian woman or non-binary writer published in 2019. From across fiction, non-fiction and of course the hybrids, the winning book is original, excellent and engaging. The unenviable decision is made by the Stella Prize judging panel, committed readers who each year read over 160 books. The Stella Prize 2020 judging panel are publisher, writer and reviewer Louise Swin, award-winning journalist Monica Attard, senior editor and journalist Jack Lattimore, memoirist and editor Zoya Patel, and poet and educator Lenny Shilton. This year, the Stella Prize reading took us through a litany of serious topics and across a host of different places. While first-time authors wowed us, established authors brought out satisfying exhalations. Publishers, big and small, 
showed their excellent taste and continued their commitment to publish a vast array of voices. Whether we were looking for diversity or not, it was there smack bang in front of us. So many rich influences, so many distinct points of view, and so many ways of depicting the current landscape. The world is in crisis, but our artists are expressing themselves as powerfully and as eloquently as ever, as they courageously grapple with the wild mess of it all. Our writers continue to attempt to tell stories big and bold, as well as those small yet significant. The differences across the reading in style and content were reassuringly reflective and disruptive. Like many Australians, so many of these stories traverse continents as we are now. The 12 books long listed for the 2020 Stella Prize are all ambitious texts. Bold and absolutely unapologetic. This is more than just a snapshot of this time and place. It's an off-road adventure that will force you to think and to rethink. We found a lot to be hopeful about here too. Not just at the stories being told, but at the quality of the art being produced. These voices are extraordinarily rich and these writers are wielding language very, very powerfully. We are lucky to have them. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the chair of the judging panel and one of the original founders of the Stella Prize, Lou Swin, who has the great privilege of announcing this year's winner. It's an enormous privilege being able to read these 160 or so books that are submitted to the Stella. And it's one we have not taken for granted. It's important in engaging with this task that we acknowledge our privilege and make the best use of it and work wherever possible towards undoing privilege. We talk about the shortlist and the longlist and the winner, but additionally, it's worth remembering that there are so many more books that we've read and enjoyed and agonized over while reading for this prize. There are books that are quite simply incredible in certain ways that don't make it onto this shortlist for one reason or another. And ultimately, when we read most of the books written by women and non-binary writers in Australia from one 12 month period, what we get is an incredible education, basically a degree. The great learning curve is philosophical there are writers who are able to explain how to hold two conflicting opinions and find a way forwards, keen to do anything but generalise, which would be so much easier and simpler, not to mention quicker. These writers are holding people accountable, the state, the country, our politicians, each other, themselves, us. And we've been fortunate to read writing by people who are devoted to telling the truth. And telling the truth is hard, it's not easy, but it is crucial. And sometimes writers get it wrong, but I am grateful that they're trying. Some of the books that didn't get long listed for this prize are from writers who will no doubt go on to see serious critical acclaim. There are books we read when choosing the prize that have left an indelible mark on me. The role of the writer gets in many ways harder. Who can justify sitting and writing while the world is metaphorically as well as literally on fire? The writer's salary is in steady decline. Who reads books, particularly fiction, when there's the Guilty Feminist podcast and iPhones and while there's Fleabag and her hot priest? Every single one of the people whose books we read for this prize are trying for something big. Every single one of their publishers and agents are believing in something that's as close to magic as we are able to believe in in this post-irony, post-digital, post-caring age. Reading becomes more and more of an imperative. We need to be rangy readers, read widely, wider than ever, read more to make sense of what's going on and challenge our sense of the world and the way we view the world around us. The more we read, the more curious we become. And while it seems as though there are people with very different views to ours, if we can try better to understand each other, which might begin with broad reading, then we might have more of a chance of clearing up the mess, making peace, and as Margaret Atwood says, saving the oceans. On our 2020 Stella shortlist, we have Here Until August by Josephine Rowe, these are simply brilliant stories. We were all incredibly impressed by the quality of the sentences, the way language is used. This book was a no-brainer for our shortlist. Diving into Glass by Carol Llewellyn is that very special beast, a memoir written with such a sharp eye and ear, unflinching in its portraits, bearing all, incredibly moving, sometimes funny, always thought-provoking. The novel There Was Still Love by Fable Parrot, who just keeps getting better with each book, such a tender story, sophisticated in structure, meticulous in its commentary on human nature, and incredibly, touchingly hopeful. Charlotte Wood's masterpiece, or mistress piece, The Weekend, is such a sharp, often painfully flat, funny, unflinching portrait of these women who've been friends for a long time, written in such easy, skillful, delightful prose. In The Yield, Tara June Winch deals with intergenerational trauma in a cleverly constructed narrative, balancing out multiple ideas and stories. In a tale, 
that is at no point predictable and at many points deeply moving. Jess Hill in See What You Made Me Do has taken what we thought we knew about domestic abuse and shaken it up, turned it completely on its head, asked the questions that we couldn't or wouldn't address, probed places beyond where our blinkered vision wanted us to look. In doing so, she's drawn our attention to the single biggest crisis that faces contemporary Australia, but she's done so in a book that is incredibly well written, intelligently argued, forensically researched, a compelling book that must be read, and it's my considerable pleasure to announce that the winner of the 2020 Stella Prize is Jess Hill for her extraordinary work of non-fiction, See What You Made Me Do. Congratulations, Jess. Thank you, Lou, and also everyone at home, please join me in congratulating the 2020 winner of the Stella Prize, Jess Hill. Hi everyone, um, this is such a huge honour. I, I just wish I could be there with all of you hugging and crying and you know doing all those things that you do at award ceremonies, I think. Um, I've actually had some time to digest the news so I can hopefully string a sentence together coherently rather than just cry down the phone. But first I want to thank the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation for having me on their country and thank their elders, past and present, for preserving their magnificent culture. When I was researching this book, time and again, the most holistic and effective responses to domestic abuse came from Indigenous individuals and communities. The traditional wisdom we have in this country is key to fixing so much of what is wrong with our failing systems. My deepest respect and gratitude for the talent fortitude and grit of the shortlisted writers, Tara June Winch for The Yield, Josephine Rowe for Here Until August, Carol Llewellyn for Diving Into Glass, Charlotte Wood for The Weekend, and Favel Parrott for There Was Still Love. It feels like a weird time to be celebrating anything. You know, it was just a few weeks ago that the majority of artists in this country had their incomes evaporate virtually overnight. And because the culture warriors don't drop tools for a global pandemic, we're also reeling from the news that vital institutions like the Sydney Writers' Festival, the Australian Review of Books, which publishes 300 writers a year, and so many others have lost their federal funding. We are being kept sane by the work of artists right now, and yet still this government won't lift a finger to help them. But you know, of everything that I learned writing See What You Made Me Do, one of the most enduring lessons was that even in our grimmest moments, we can hold despair in one hand and hope in the other. In this time, hope for me means that while everything is cancelled, maybe some of us will start to see the world and ourselves with a greater sense of clarity. And maybe this clarity will renew our determination to fight for something better than the status quo. I think that's what makes winning the Stella Prize so sweet, aside from the obvious life-changing financial prize, that is. Uh, and that is because the Stella Prize began as a challenge to that toxic idea of normality. You know, it was normal for men to win the lion's share of literary prizes. It was normal for men to have their books reviewed more than women. And the Stella not only exposed that normal for the lie that it was, but it also put literary awards in the spotlight. And lo and behold, women started winning. Now it's glorious to become part of the Stella Prize alumni, not only because I feel like I'm being initiated into a group of writers who are at the height of their craft, but also because I feel like I've become part of this pirate band of rabble rousers, and I am very here for that. So a huge thank you to the Stella judges who had to read 170 books between them and also the entire team behind the prize who have absolutely slogged their guts out uh, to make this event happen in the virtual world. One question that I'm constantly asked is, why did you write this book? And to be honest, I'm still figuring that out for myself. But what I'm starting to realise is that writing this book was like my calling. What I do know, aside from the mysterious functions of my subconscious, is that I wrote this book because it needed to be written. 
I was tired of hearing victim survivors say that their friends and family couldn't understand what they'd been through, why they'd made the choices they'd made. And in the 40 years since the first shelter had opened in Australia, no one had written a book that revealed the private and public phenomenon of domestic abuse. And I felt like that had to be rectified. But even as I was signing the contract in the summer of 2016, I was resistant. I knew that writing this book would take a profound personal toll on me, and it did. If I'm to be honest, the four years I spent writing this book took me to a dangerous edge. I earned barely any money. Um, we were sent to the brink financially, and this is all as we were having our first child. Um, I lost friends. I missed weddings. There was almost no time, apart from the hours I spent with our newborn daughter, that I wasn't working. But I don't for a minute regret the time that I spent writing this book. The struggle was very real, but it was also a magnificent process. Every day I had a perception turned upside down, or I'd read something that was just stunning, or I'd talk to someone and their story would be harrowing and, you know, impossible to imagine but also amazing and their resilience and their resistance would just blow me away and my own relationship with my partner david was utterly transformed eventually for the better uh, by what we both learned during this process so um, the thing is this is not a niche issue or a women's issue this is one of the most important and greatest stories going on in this country right now. And we all need to understand it because there are literally millions of us walking around who have experienced it as adults or as children or both. And what we also need to understand is that while all intimate relationships are vulnerable to abuse, domestic abuse is not inevitable. It is a social problem that can be solved and it must be solved. But the first steps to solving it are believing that that is possible. And that's what I want. I set out to prove with this book. So since I emerged from my solitary writing confinement last year, the experience of bringing this book into the world has been both exhausting and utterly transcendent. It has connected with people in ways that I never dreamed possible. Hundreds of people shared their stories with me, There've been hugs and tears in the signing lines, which are truly a thing of beauty. Uh, there are people who just hold my gaze and we just know. There are even men who've come up to me and confessed their own abuse and they've bought the book for themselves or for their adult children. And then there are others who approach me and they look really uneasy. And they tell me that upon hearing me speak, they've just realized that their own partners are abusive. And then there's everybody else and um, people who have no history with domestic abuse or who don't think they have. They'll say things like, I can't wait to read this. And then they'll backtrack guiltily because you're not supposed to say something like that about a book like this. But why not? I've been obsessed by this subject for more than five years because it is fascinating. Why shouldn't we talk openly about the entire spectrum of intimacy, power, control, even violence? This is not just a book about men beating their wives. It is about the culture that underpins and enables that abuse. It is about love. It is about power. Part of the Australian story has been our struggle to face the difficult truths of our recent history. And to me, this is a book about what happens when there's nothing in our culture to help us process these unseen forces, and instead, they erupt behind closed doors. Our future depends on telling and real... Our future depends on telling and reading these stories, not recoiling from them. To me, this book is about all of us. That was actually my working title for this book, The Story of Us. I got an email the other day that perfectly exemplifies this. It was from a guy who had just read it with his book club. And he writes that, as a fella, I felt drawn into this dark vortex of our own cultural problems with masculinity and the patriarchy. And the book put words, shame and entitlement, for instance, 
to experiences that all the guys and girls in the club were able to openly discuss. I feel like you've opened up a new toolbox of words and concepts that I can reach into to understand domestic abuse and ourselves. We feel more empathetic and capable of trying to help as a result. I'm glad you wrote this book. We're better people having read it. Feedback like that makes all of those lonely hours worthwhile. Now, this book couldn't have happened without a village supporting it and me. And first and foremost, my partner, David, who not only edited every word of this book, but also co-wrote the chapter on shame. David, even when you were fed up with this book, you were still utterly devoted to it and worked tirelessly with me to make sure it was right. For all the late night discussions, the weekends sacrificed, the endless housework and solo parenting, I love you and I'm so grateful. To my family, I am so thankful for the love and wonder you brought to our daughter Stevie during this time and for the hours that you gave me to write. Mum, you devoted countless days and hours and I am forever indebted to you for that. Dad, you turned up like clockwork every week and Sue, you made that possible. Lorraine, for the weeks you stayed with us, you were our rock. And my brother Joel has been a one-man publicity machine for this book and a source of unrelenting enthusiasm. Huge thanks also to Nick Fike, the first editor who commissioned me to write a long-form essay about domestic abuse for the monthly, the first time I had ever written about domestic abuse. What vision. At Black Ink, I think he was the first to understand that this was an issue that had not been properly explored, and he risked supporting what was then a still unglamorous and treacherous topic. To Chris Bullock at Background Briefing, you had the courage to go where few other editors had dared to go, into the secretive, hostile environment of the family law courts. Thank you for helping me be brave. And the marvellous Black Ink books, firstly to Aviva Tuffield, who commissioned this book and forgave me for every missed deadline. This is the reason that this book exists. Thank you so much. To Kirsty Innes Will and Chris Fike, your fine intellects were a boon to this book, and I am forever grateful for how hard you worked on it and for the months that you lived with it in your head. To my publicist, Marianne Blythe, your dedication to getting this book into people's hands was way above and beyond, and it was stunning to watch. Last but certainly not least, thank you to everyone who shared their knowledge, their story, their expertise, and trusted me to do the right thing with it. It still makes me shudder sometimes to remember the people who sat with me, shaking with the pain and trauma of what they were telling me, taking me to places of such deep personal pain and darkness. These were people who came to me with the belief that bringing that pain forward and putting their stories on the line might just make people understand and help protect future generations. There was something truly awesome about what you did. Every day I sat and stared at that blank screen, every time I missed another social gathering, I did that for you. I hope you feel honoured by this book. And to all the victim survivors, those who have suffered at the hands of partners, at the hands of parents, those who are trapped right now, I hope you feel that this is a win for you too. I want you to feel in your bones that your stories matter. The world is listening. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jess. And I think everyone watching, wherever you might be, your bedroom, your living room, will be joining me in congratulating Jess and what an amazing speech there too. Look, this book, See What You Made Me Do, is in my view a seminal piece of work. It is now more important than ever that this book is read. It is genuinely a groundbreaking piece of work. It combines incredible storytelling with facts and I think that combination makes it particularly special. Let's just think for a moment about why this book matters so much today. We're living in such difficult times. I know it's a cliche to use the term, but they are genuinely unprecedented times. Never has this book been more important. In just the past month, I think this is really important that we just pause for a moment to reflect on this. Google Australia has seen a 75% increase in the number of searches for domestic abuse help, 75% increase. Jess Hill's book 
gives us the key information about how to tackle this, not for generations ahead, but for now. We can do that, even during this pandemic, and we know we must do that. There must never be a pause on dealing with domestic abuse. So Jess, thank you so much for your work, and you so much deserve this award. On behalf of the board and team, I congratulate Jess Hill on winning the 2020 Stella Prize. See What You Made Me Do addresses the crisis in domestic abuse in Australia, an issue that disproportionately affects women and children. We commend this book for its dedication to these survivors, their stories, perspectives and experiences. We know that during this time of social distancing and isolation, frontline domestic abuse and family violence workers are responding to an increase in cases. If you or someone you know needs support, these national services are here to help. To you at home, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It has been my pleasure and all of our pleasure to make our way into your lounge rooms or wherever you are watching us from. Continue the conversation online using the hashtag 2020 Stella Prize. Then tune in on Monday the 20th of April for an in-depth conversation about See What You Made Me Do between Lou Swin and Jess Hill.